Hi, my name is Luke Monnington, and in this video, we're going to be talking about AI explainability. We're going to be popping the hood on some of today's most sophisticated models to understand what makes them tick. And to do that, we're going to be going through a recent OpenAI research paper where they use GPT-4 to explain the individual neurons within GPT-2. Let's dive into it. And don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. All right, so why is this significant? What is the importance? Well, first of all, bias detection. We want to be able to dig into the neural network and understand what exactly is making it make any type of bias predictions. Next up is error detection and correction. So with this one, if the model is making incorrect prediction, we want to be able to take a look into the neural network and understand at what point did the neural network start going wrong and what are some ways that we can mitigate that in the future. Next up is ethical considerations. So with this one, we want to be able to make sure that the model is making predictions and acting in a way that is aligned with human ethics. So maybe there are certain neurons and structures of neurons that activate when the neural network is aligned versus when the neural network isn't aligned. So we want to be able to see that so we can proactively take measures in the case that the neural network is not aligned with human ethics. Next up is safety and security. If we have a better understanding of how the neural network is working on the inside, then we can feel more safe letting it into the wild and having it interact with people because we can be more confident in the robustness of the predictions. Finally is deception detection. And this ties in a little bit more with the ethical considerations in that sometimes these models knowingly lie to us. A good example of that would be the Snapchat LLM, which intentionally lies sometimes. So what if there are certain neurons or structures of neurons that activate when the neural network is intentionally lying? That would be really good for us to know so that we can take measures to proactively prevent that in the future. So these last 60 years, there's been a huge lag in AI explainability, and this is caused by multiple factors. First of all, complexity growth. It turns out to be way easier to just build a more powerful neural network by adding computational power and adding data. But in order to do AI explainability, now we have a much more complicated system and we need to be able to understand the inner workings of that. So as a result, the power of neural networks are scaling much more quickly than our ability to explain it. Next up is opaque models. And this goes into the way that these neural networks are trained. The issue with the way that this is set up is that it's very black box in nature in that we feed something into it and then we get an output, but we have no idea what's going on on the inside. Next up is the resource gap. When it comes to AI development, all the business applications come with building a more complex model, and there isn't as much money to be made in being able to explain the, why the model is predicting the way it's predicting. Next up is regulatory lag. And what I mean by this is that the power of these AI neural networks are increasing dramatically, and they're getting all these new abilities that we never had before. As a result, it's really difficult for the regulatory authorities to keep up. Finally is ethical challenges. As these AI systems gain new abilities, it leads to all these new ethical questions that we never had to face before. Is it ethical for us to create a deepfake of someone or to replicate someone's voice and use it in a song, for example? Where should the line be drawn? With this all in mind, how do you decode a neural network? Well, OpenAI was suggesting a way of using GPT-4 to explain the individual neuron activations. An advantage of using a neural network in order to explain the inner workings of other neural networks is that there's scalability. As the most cutting edge neural networks get larger and larger, we have an automated way of providing an explanation for why the neural network is acting the way it's acting. Another advantage is human understandable outputs. Since GPT-4 works with natural language, that means that any human would be able to go in and understand in natural language terms why that neuron is performing in the way that it is. So recently, OpenAI published a paper where they used GPT-4 to explain the individual activations of the neurons in GPT-2. And their methodology was a three-step methodology. First, they generated a natural language explanation of each neuron's activations using GPT-4. Second, after generating that natural language hypothesis, they used GPT-4 to simulate the activations of the neurons on new tokens. Finally, they compared the actual activations with the simulated activations in order to come up with a correlation score to see how well those simulated activations line up with the actual activations. I realize that's a lot, so let's dive a little bit deeper. Step one is to generate the explanation. This involves creating a prompt. And the way the prompt is created, is by first creating the token activation pairs. And the activations are normalized to be discrete numbers between zero to 10. Additionally, they found that focusing on non-zero activations generally results in a better performing model, 
because tokens with a higher activation are more representative of what the neuron is actually doing. So after doing the normalization, we have the token activation pairs, and we asked GPT-4 to generate a natural language hypothesis for what this neuron might be activating on. Here's an example from the OpenAI website. So we're asking GPT-4 to give an explanation to guess what the neuron is activating on. And from this text, we can see that some tokens with high activation are words like beyond a shadow of a doubt and for sure, and the words with any kind of authority. So then GPT-4 gives an explanation that maybe this neuron is activating on phrases related to certainty and confidence. Now that we have this hypothesis, we can move on to step two, which is to simulate the activation. The way this is done is that we take that natural language hypothesis and we give GPT-4 new tokens and ask GPT-4 to predict the activations of the tokens as discrete values between zero and 10. And there's two ways of doing this. There's a one at a time method where we feed GPT-4 a single token at a time, or there's an all at once method where we feed GPT-4 a bunch of tokens all at the same time. The advantage of the one at a time method is that it provides a detailed explanation of the individual token. But the issue with the one at a time method is that feeding them through GPT-4 can be very slow and computationally expensive. After doing some testing, OpenAI was able to find that the all at once method was just as accurate as the one at a time method. So they continued to use the one at a time method for the rest of the paper. Here's an example from the OpenAI website where they are simulating the activations. So assuming that the neuron activates on phrases related to certainty and confidence, GPT-4 now needs to guess how strongly the neuron will respond for each token in this given text. So GPT-4 ends up saying that it thinks that the words know for a fact, the words correct and can follow are going to be higher activation for this particular neuron. That brings us into step three, which is to score the explanations. Now that we have the simulated behavior of the neuron and we do it across multiple excerpts, we want to actually compare the simulated activations with the actual activations to see how closely they align. So first, in order to do this comparison, we need to understand that the neurons in the GPT-2 model don't actually stay within the bounds of zero to 10. It can go below zero or it can go higher than 10. So since we have these simulated activations that are between zero to 10, the idea is that we want to take those simulated activations and we want to calibrate them so that they have the same mean and variance as the actual activations of the neuron. That way we can get a more apples to apples comparison. After that, we calculate a score, which is based on a correlation coefficient between the actual and the simulated activations. With the equation that they used, a score of one means identical behavior between the real and the simulated activations, and a score of zero means completely random behavior between the simulated and actual activations. So for example, here for the real activations, there's more activation for the words from the first line and the words for effect, whereas for the simulated activations, there's more activation for the word no for effect and the word correct one. In comparing the simulated and real activations, they're able to calculate a score of about 0.37, which means that there's not that much correlation between the real and the simulated activations in this case. One potential issue with having GPT-4 generate a natural language hypothesis and then simulating the activations and calculating a score is that this completely removes the human from the loop. So how do we know that the GPT-4 explanation is actually human understandable? One way to test this is to have GPT-4 come up with five different proposed explanations for the activation of a particular neuron, and then give the human labelers a task where they see the same text excerpts and the same activations as a simulator model, but are then asked to rate and rank those five proposed explanations based on how well those explanations capture the activation patterns. And what they were able to see is that the humans do tend to prefer the higher scoring explanations over the lower scoring explanations. So this is a good sign that the natural language explanations that GPT-4 is coming up with are human understandable. Another thing that they considered is when creating the hypothesis, should they be using sequences where the activations of the tokens are in the top percentile? Or should they use random sequences where they don't take into account the activation of the token on the individual neuron? And so they tested both out. And they found that by using top activating sequences, that that consistently ended up generating a better hypothesis than picking any random sequence. And in fact, including examples with random or low quantile sequences actually ended up reducing the explanation score of the hypothesis. So then another question is, which type of sequences should you use for scoring the data set? And the advantage of random only scoring is that you'd have a better understanding of how well this hypothesis performs on the general data set. But a disadvantage is that a lot of these sequences are very sparse. 
So you run the risk of potentially having a bunch of sequences that don't even have any real activation. So the solution to this is to do top and random scoring. So this would show the ability to capture the neuron's most activating behavior, as well as giving a snapshot on how well it performs on the general data set. Here's a graph for the correlation scores of all the neurons for the first layer. As we can see, there are some neurons that are very well explained by using this hypothesis method, but also there's a significant amount of neurons that aren't that well explained. Now here's a graph of the correlation scores on layer 40. As we can see, the deeper we go into the neural network, the less this technique actually works with explaining the neuron's behavior. So what we're seeing is that the explanations that come out of the hypothesis model are too generalized. So they may work well on sequences that represent the neuron's top activating behavior, but when the hypothesis is applied to any random sequence, the performance of the model quickly goes down the drain. Additionally, when the explainer model is creating the hypothesis, it frequently overlooks negative evidence. So what if there was a way to bring in new evidence to target the specific weak points of the hypothesis? Thus, they introduced a revision process. The first step is to source new evidence. So what they do is they have GPT-4 generate sequences that match the existing hypothesis. And the aim is to find sentences where the token's real activation is low, but the simulated activation is high. This would indicate a false positive in a possible area where the hypothesis could be improved. And what they were finding was about 42% of the generated sequences had false positives. So this provides an independent signal that typically the explanations are too general. What if we could take advantage of the emergent ability of GPT-4 to reflect on itself? So we could give GPT-4 the original tokens and activations, the original hypothesis, and then also giving it the sequences and activations of the sequences that were specifically designed to target the weak points of the hypothesis. And they were able to find that giving GPT-4 the chance to reflect on itself did generate better hypotheses. Also, another interesting point is that if they left out the initial hypothesis and just gave GPT-4 all of the same evidence, the performance wouldn't actually increase. So this shows that having that initial hypothesis is very important for the model to be able to improve upon itself. Here's a graph of the comparison of the token lookup table explanation, the context-based explanation, and the revised context-based explanation. It's interesting to note that the token lookup table and the context-based explanation seem to be performing about the same. This would indicate that a token lookup table would provide just as much information as this whole natural language hypothesis workflow. But when you give it a chance to reflect on itself, it improves across the board. It would be really interesting to see other research papers build on top of this and incrementally have better and better performance of the models. This would be the type of leaderboard chasing that I'd like to see. So by utilizing this workflow, what were the type of neurons that they ended up discovering? They ended up discovering a lot of really interesting neurons. For example, they discovered a simile neuron also a neuron for phrases related to certainty and confidence, and also a neuron for things that were done correctly. And actually, OpenAI has a visualization website where you can really dig in and see all the hypotheses that were generated from the neurons. Additionally, they found some neurons that predict the next token. So there were some neurons that predicted that the next token would be the word from, and also there were some neurons that predicted a misspelling of the next token. For example, misspelling the word from to be the word form. What they also found is that the more capable models tended to have more interesting neurons. But the focus of this research paper was on GPT-2, so they didn't go into that too much. In total, they found over 1,000 neurons that scored over a 0.8, which means that according to GPT-4, the hypothesis accounts for most of the neurons' top activating behavior. So with this all in mind, what are some opportunities for the open source community to get involved with this? Well, first of all, OpenAI open sourced the datasets and the visualization for all 307,200 neurons of the GPT-2 XL model. Next, OpenAI open sourced all the code for the explanation and the scoring using publicly available models on the OpenAI API. So there's an opportunity for the open source community to start working with these tools, getting involved, and coming up with ways to improve the explainability of the neurons overall. Finally, I'd like to give my opinion on the road to better AI explainability. So first of all, I think there should be an emphasis on public interest. We need to get the public involved, get the open source community involved, and raise awareness on this very important topic. Next, I think there should be more funding going towards this area. The first place is I think that governments should allocate more funding towards AI research and AI explainability efforts. The second place is I think that the companies that are on the cutting edge, the companies that are creating the most powerful models that are most likely to be dangerous, they should also be putting some resources towards better explainability and a more in-depth understanding of what exactly these AI systems are capable of doing. So if there are any new emergent capabilities that might be dangerous, to be able to catch them sooner rather than later. 
Next, I think there should be more organizations dedicated to responsible AI development and AI explainability. One announcement that I'm pretty happy about is that the NSF recently announced that there are seven new national artificial intelligence research institutes. So I think this is a step in the right direction. Also, I think there should be some prizes and competitions. It'd be great to see some hackathons that are dedicated to AI explainability, and maybe even some Kaggle competitions dedicated to this topic. Finally, I don't want to discount the impact of the open source community. I think if the open source community came together and made this a priority, that we could make great strides in our AI explainability efforts. That's all I have for this presentation. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing, and I'll see you all in the next one.